Week one in the books and ready for week two of college football here in the Big Ten as we welcome back our friends from Bally's. Great to be here with you on Believe in Big Ten. Another episode coming at you here. I'm Rhett Lewis and I am fired up this week because we have a marquee matchup in college football. Two brand names and we get one of the voices of the soundtrack to that game uh, here with us today. To help us break down a little Texas, Michigan from the big house, we welcome one of the voices of Michigan football, a Michigan legend, and a great NFL pro, and all-around human being, the one and only John Jansen, everybody. What's up, John? How we doing, brother? Imagine every, everyone's disappointed when they finally find out who you're actually you. talking about. I'm trying to – I'm, I'm like, wait, where's this guy at? <laughs> Well, you know what? Your reputation precedes you, my friend. Uh, and I look after our two years getting to hang out a little bit uh, when I was doing IU radio and, and getting to uh, to see you in Bloomington and then in uh, Ann Arbor, although the results weren't great. It was always good to hang with you, brother. So appreciate uh, you stopping by to talk some ball for us today, my friend. I'm just happy that football season is here. We yeah. finally have week one completely in the books. We know a yeah. little bit about each and every team. And now this weekend, we've got – obviously, the big matchup is going to be here in Ann Arbor. I'm, I'm excited to be a part That's of it. Great. But seeing what college football looks like now with yeah. 16 teams in the SEC, 18 in the Big Ten, watching LSU and USC, and I'm like, this, this is actually a, a Big Ten team. Well, wait, let's go – I mean, like, I mean, we're Big Ten guys. Like, we're Big Ten traditionalists, and we're happy to welcome, yeah. you know, Oregon and Washington and USC and UCLA, especially happy when they help us, you know, put one in the Big Ten tally in the Big Ten versus SEC debate, right? I mean, like, we're we're coming up roses right now. It's 17-1 and one in the conference. Let's go. I know. It, 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 and what, what should have happened, too, was that, you know, Minnesota should have won. We should have been undefeated in the in the first week of the season. But, 100%. Hey, and yeah, you, because you know, war break. last couple of years, I mean, Dragon Kessich is one of the best kickers in this conference, and he misses two field goals. Like, that. that's uncharacteristic of, of a guy of his caliber, but it, it goes to show you, right hash for a left-footed kicker is, is a little bit difficult, especially uh, when you get it twice with the game on the line there. Uh, all right, let's get to the game at hand here. Um, but before we do that, I think it'll help to paint the picture of what Michigan looks like this week if we touch a little bit on the Fresno uh, victory. Again, victory, maybe not as convincing as you'd expect. There were some ups and downs, certainly individually, unit-wise, and as a team in Sharon Moore's first year and first game, uh, rather rolling it out as head coach, and you were there for all of it. Um, I got to start here at the quarterback spot. Davis Warren, Alex Orgy. Uh, obviously, Orgy gets into the end zone, uh, but not really used, you know, as, as a passer at all, which is kind of what we saw from him a year ago in limited duty. How do you feel like this is going to move forward for Sharon Moore with Davis and Alex? Well, I think, I mean, much like we saw last year with JJ and Alex, and but you're going to see more of Alex. The, the question is going to be when he comes in, is it just simply every time going to be a run? And I mean, you can't you can't win games like that being that predictable. So yeah. they're going to have to find a couple of passes here and there that he's very confident in because the one pass, obviously touchdown, the other one, yeah, great. it was a short <laughs> hop to a wide open receiver. So, yeah. you know, 50%, it's not, not, not what you're looking for, especially for wide open guys, but for Davis Warren, Davis is a guy that has mastered this offense and he's comfortable. I don't think he was as comfortable as he hoped he would be in that game. Third quarter, I felt like he was he was just thinking about things too much. He was yeah. he was looking at the reads and and visibly going through each one and then throwing the ball away. It just I, I think having that experience against Fresno State uh, it, for every unit, whether it's offensive line, quarterback, wide receiver, they all are so young and some experience, but not starting experience. So they kind of had some of those aha moments where they get back in the meeting and the coach says, I've been telling you for the past six months, this is what it was going to look like. This is what it's going to be. <laughs> right. And you and I both know until you experience it, yeah, it, 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 it doesn't ring true. So now all of a sudden they sat there and they're like, Oh, that's what you were talking about. We've all had yeah. that moment with our kids. And oh. uh, unfortunately <laughs> we, uh, we had it ourselves as players. Yes. Yes, we did. Uh, absolutely. Right. Um, Okay, so staying on the offensive side of the ball, 
Donovan Edwards production concern level is where for you after 11 carries and 27 yards? I mean, it's exactly what we saw from him last year. As yeah. in every down back, I don't think he's the guy. And, I mean, everybody wants him to. He's a great kid. Um, but Kalel Mullings came in, and it was, you know, 90 yards. And it was in that last drive where things started to really click in the fourth quarter. He had runs of 15. He had runs of 21. They had, ended up hitting Colston Loveland, who had, you know, yeah. eight catches for 80-plus yards. So I think they found some answers. In, in regards to Donovan, hey, p- put him on at wide receiver. Line him up there. Run him, get him run touches. Some, so, yeah, get him touches. You could still get him touches, just not handing him the ball. I think they found that Khalil Mullings is the guy that they, on first and second down. Now, he does have big play potential. Donovan does. We saw we've that seen in that the Crows. title game. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've seen it throughout the course of his career. But as an every down guy, he is he's more of a change up pitch than he is yeah. the fastball. Yeah. Um. And then, you know, obviously your expertise uh, watching those big guys uh, up front, John, five new starters, right? Essentially replacing, I know Giovanni Alati has played, uh, right? And and so we've seen him before. And some of these guys have come in and, and, you know, filled in at times. Overall, where are we with cohesiveness up front on the offensive line? Uh, a work in progress. And it's going to continue to be a work in progress. And, and I think they're going to be a good offensive line. But when you have the experience like Michigan has had over the last three years of great offensive line, Joe Moore winning offensive lines, yeah. and you step back to just a good offensive line, it takes a little adjusting to, um, you know, for the fans and for me and, and for everybody. But, you know, you got two guys on the right side um, and Evan Link and Giovanni Ohadi, who you already mentioned, first time they're really working together in that environment. Same thing with the center. Dom Jadis was a defensive lineman this time last year. In Mm. fact, he was a defensive lineman in spring ball. So you've got new experiences all across the board. These guys are going to get in there with Grant Newsom, the offensive line coach. They're going to watch the film. They're all smart guys. They all want what is best for this team. And, And I do believe this week, even though the competition is going to be much tougher, uh, they're going to play a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's what you want to see, right? Do you rise to the level of the competition? Um, and, and can you play when the red light is shining the brightest, right? And in, in the big time stage, like this is going to be the big noon kickoff on Fox, uh, noon Eastern from the big house, number four, Texas, just the second meeting between these two teams. Isn't that kind it's of crazy? Amazing. Right. Yeah, when somebody told me that, I'm like, it's not possible. I know. And, and it's the first time in the big house. And the first time since 2005, I mean, like if it's anything like that game was back at the Rose Bowl, 38, 37, like sign me up, John, sign me up uh, for that. Yeah. For, for the most part, I'll take a different result. Different but, result. Yeah, yeah. We'll put yeah, that. I'll, we'll I'll put take that the excitement of the game. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, no question. Uh, and then quickly, you know, on the defense, before we look ahead here to Texas, um, I mean, Mason Graham and Kenneth Grant, I mean, like, as advertised, Will Johnson, as advertised, like that feels like, man, Sharon Moore, I can hang my hat on those guys, on that unit, on that side of the ball. Yeah, and Jay Sean Barnum. The, Jay the Barnum, of course. Maryland. I yeah. mean, he had a monster game, and, and you could see what he could do. And I think, I mean, Wake Martindale, first, first year defensive yes. coordinator for Michigan, it's new. And he's coming from the NFL where, you know, he's always got these preseason games. And I really felt like when I watched the game plan, especially when I watched it the second or third time, it felt like the game plan was much like you would see in an NFL preseason game where he's throwing a lot of stuff at his players. He's trying to get them in some uncomfortable positions because he needs to know, he needs to know right now, what are these guys good at? What are they doing well? What can I count on when we play Texas? Because their group of receivers is really good. Oh, yeah. And when you have to do that, calling the game, even though it was close and it was within one score, there was never this feeling. I've been in games where you're like, oh, I can't. I'm really nervous. I was never nervous about losing that game. And so I think, you know, the, the same thing was on the field. When we were talking to Jason Avant, who's our sideline guy, there was never this feel uh, that you were going to lose it, and it just felt like Wink was testing things out. I mean, the, he blitzed at a pace of about 58%. I was going to ask you, gonna how, how much zero blitz did we see in this game? Oh, it was unbelievable. And, so, and you've got new guys. You're trying to find out who's going to play opposite. Uh, is it going to be Jair Hill? Is he opposite Will Johnson? Makari yeah. Page, we know what he's what he's all about, but you're trying to figure out Zeke Berry, can he cover anybody? Can he yeah. can he do it one on one? 
you you expose them when it's not going to cost you. And and he learned a lot. Yeah, and, and that's uh, that's exciting to me. And like that was the one thing you know with Wink coming in, I was like, boy, you know, live by the sword, die by the sword. Sometimes <laughs> with that pressure, right? With with the way that he'll get after and send the house, right? Yeah. But like, look. I would feel pretty comfortable doing that with the experience and talent level in the back end, right? With, with Will Johnson and the safeties and that whole group. Well, I, yes, yes. But you, I mean, you've got to, even though they do have some experience, Zeke it's gotta is be experienced. Measured. It's got to, yeah, it's got to be calculated. Yeah. Um, and you've got to pick and choose your time. The one thing I'll disagree with Wink on is, I think Jay Sean Barham is is a terri- I think he's a stud at linebacker. Yeah. I don't like lining him up over the nose as a stand up linebacker. Back him off the ball just a little bit as an offensive yeah. lineman. If I can get my hand on you right away, I could take away all that athletic ability. And I mean, we like to pump ourselves up and tell, hey, we're great athletes. All this stuff. Those guys are better athletes than yes. we are. So if I can get my hand on you right away, I can eliminate all that shuck and jive that you might have. And, and I could now, now it's my advantage. So back them up a little bit, let them get a running start and and create yeah. some angst for that center. And I understand what he's trying to do. And that's get the single for Mason and get the single for Kenneth. But, you know, let's, let's use everything to our advantage. Yeah. And let's see if, you know, maybe we'll mix that in, mix that in here a little bit. Uh, certainly, you know, I, I, you, the talent with Barham, I'm glad you brought that up because I was really, um, excited to see what this change of scenery would do for him, right? Because freshman year, you know, he plays as a true freshman, you know, as a middle backer for Maryland, right? And really had a terrific year. And I felt like last year kind of got lost in the shuffle a little bit, wasn't as productive, and and clearly he hits the portal. Um, and it made a lot of sense that he ends up in Michigan replacing, you know, that stud linebacker core that had been there for, you know, quite some time there in Ann Arbor. So I'm glad to see that that has been a hit so far for Michigan. Let's start with your checklist now for Michigan against Texas. What's at the top of the check? Like, what do you want to see? What's your level of intrigue? Where do you go when you first look at this matchup between Michigan and Texas? Well, I mean, when you look at Texas, it's all about speed. Um, yep. Speed at receiver, talent at quarterback, and and size up front. I mean, everything that they lost last year with Xavier Worthy and you know two receivers playing on Sundays now, your two stud defensive tackles, you know, all of those guys have been replaced through the transfer portal. And so, you know, it, it and they hit the ground running at Colorado State. There was great – you could see the relationship that Quinn Ewers has built with that wide receiving group. You know, it, they didn't miss a beat. They came out running. Um, and so it's all about speed. So Michigan is, is going to have to do one thing – or they're going to have to do a handful of things. But the first thing is possess the football. They're going to have to learn how to run the ball. They're going to have to be effective in the run game. And when that happens, hey, you win time of possession. Maybe you start winning that field position battle. And I know we talked briefly about Minnesota's kicker, but when you have a kicker yeah. like Dominic Zavada and, and what he's able to do, anytime you get to the 40-yard line, you kind of feel like you've got points. Now right. maybe you take a couple of shots against a team like Texas. Yeah, I think that's a uh, that's kind of an intriguing piece here. So let's talk a little bit then about the the pass game for Michigan going into this matchup against Texas. You know, if if you need to rely on that, what are you relying on? Uh, like, who are we relying? Samaj Morgan. How do we, what are we looking at with that wide receiver core? And obviously, Colston Loveland, you know, is is probably target number one in any situation. But as you kind of put the the entire group together. How do you see that attack against this Longhorn defense? Well, Samaj Morgan's got to find a way to get open. He's got to run some precise routes. Yeah. Um, and and one of the things that they have to understand as well is Fred Moore on the interception, run a better route and obviously a better ball, and you've got a touchdown. And, and it immediately changes the look, the feel, everything yeah. that we're talking about this week. So make some corrections there, run precise routes, but also be aware the pre-snap look you've got to understand when there's a blitz coming. Hey, do your film study and understand when the blitz is coming because you may have to get your head turned around just a little bit quicker if they're going to bring one more than, than the offense can block. And those are all of the little things that you, I mean, you know this, as, as an yeah. experienced receiver, you see those things and you kind of react innately to those. Yeah. But it's not something that you you show up as a freshman understanding. Now these guys are sophomores, some of them juniors. You've got to you've got to understand that 
sometimes you just you may not be able to complete the route. You got to get your head turned around because that ball's coming out quick. That's one thing. And then it's Donovan Edwards. They've got to find a way to get him, especially coming out of the backfield. Yes. Hey, every once in a while you hand him the ball just because you, you're setting other things up, but get him one on one with the linebacker. I'll take that matchup all day long. Colson Loveland, I don't care who they defend him with. I'll take that matchup all day long. So there are options for this offense to be able to be as explosive in the pass game. They just have to be a little bit more tuned in to, to what they're doing individually. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And maybe that's that's an area where you can integrate Alex Orgy a bit more into the pass game when you're trying to take advantage of what Donovan Edwards can do, right? Just some quick hitters, get the ball in his hand. Let's let him go get out on the perimeter and make a play, right? I wonder if if that's something we might continue to see develop uh, throughout the course of this season. And then, you know, just lastly, as you look at Quinn Ewers, man, uh, I got a chance to watch him this summer down at the Manning Passing Academy, John. It is a special talent. Coming mm-hmm. that ball coming out of his hand is, you know, he's not the most like um, he's kind of unassuming as an athlete, like as a as a body type, as a frame. Not to say that he's small or anything, he just doesn't like jump out at you the way that let's say Orgy does or, or other guys yeah. around the country. Um, but man, the way that ball just explodes out of his hand, it's it is it's different, and the way that he just kind of effortlessly it almost reminds me of a little Aaron Rodgers, the way that he lets that thing go, can fit it into any kind of any kind of hole. But you know, when we're looking at guys like Will Johnson, you know, defending guys like Isaiah Bond, you know, for for Texas, I mean, Will wears two. You know, last guy that, you know, that wore two and played, you know, up to that Defense. elite level yeah. one, the damn Heisman, right? So this is that type of stage for Will Johnson. You feel like he's up for that kind of challenge? Uh, I do. And and I'm excited to see because if he's going to be a top draft pick, this is, yeah. this is a showcase. It's a showcase for Kenneth Grant, Mason Graham, all yes. those guys that people are talking about, oh, well, they're projected to be in the top 10. Well, yeah. if that's where you're projected, that's your ability to whom much is given, much is expected. This is yeah. this is the time that you've got to come through with some of those plays. We saw it in the fourth quarter against Fresno State, the pick six. I mean that. I mean, just about any defensive back could see that one coming a mile away. But yeah. Will Johnson had the ability to follow through on it, and yeah, have some one-on-one matches because Wink's going to put him in that. He's going to put him in man coverage. He's going to put him in an island. Now let's you got to come through in some of these moments. And and you know when you're talking about Quinn Ewers. I, there's no question. He's got all the intangibles. The one thing yeah. that we've got to make him prove is that he's a good decision maker. That's that, it. I mean, you go back to the Oklahoma game, even the interception he threw against Colorado State. You're like, what were you thinking? And and so you look at some of those and how can you force him into making some of those decisions? And if you're able to pressure with four, and you should with the talent Michigan has and drop seven. Now, all of a sudden, you complicate things. You make things blurry in the secondary, and you force some of those bad decisions. Last one here for you, John. Certainly appreciate you giving us uh, some, some some of your time here this week. The vibe with Sharon Moore, right? Game one, now in the books. What's it feel like with the way that he is running this program and the way that guys are kind of understanding his message and trying to put it into uh, action on the field? Well, there's an unassuming confidence because when you say a guy exudes confidence, you kind of get the air that there's some arrogance there. Yeah, There's not the arrogance that was here the last nine years. Uh, you know, when you think about Jerome Moore, you think offensive line coach, and those of us who have been around offensive line coaches, they're the most non-arrogant individuals. They're very selfless, but he has this confidence. When he walks around, guys feel confident that when he says something, this is how it's going to happen. When he talks about things and he follows through, all of those things, he just has this confidence. When he walks in a room, you feel like, hey, everything's going to be all right. He talks to the guys about improving from week one to week two. He showed them film from the improvements over the last couple of years of, hey, this is the way we look like in week one. We ended up winning a national championship, but this (laughs) isn't the team that won the national championship. This is the team that made the progress from week one to week two and then throughout the course of the year. And so showing these guys, especially the young offensive line, that you don't have to be perfect. You're not going to be perfect. That's it. That's it. You can't be. But how do you continue to improve and how do you bounce back? Yeah, no question. A uh, lot to be answered. A lot of questions to be answered in this game for both teams as they have their eyes towards the college football playoff. John Jansen with us, one of the voices of Michigan radio, Michigan football on Learfield. Thank you so much, John, for giving us a few minutes, bud. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me. 
All right, Big Ten friends, back here with you on Bally's and on Sirius XM here on the Believe in Big Ten show and going to move into one of the biggest games that we talked about from last week, which of course was USC and LSU and how that points these Trojans forward after a huge win over the Tigers from Las Vegas in the kickoff week. I mean, so much to get through um, here. Let's start with Miller Moss quarterback we all wondered could he replicate that performance that he had in the holiday bowl where he threw six touchdowns it was in total command I think the short answer right now is yes really impressed with the kind of the low blood pressure that he had in this game despite the gravity of it despite the athleticism and talent on that LSU defense I thought Miller was excellent I thought some of Miller Moss's best throws were on throws where he got hit and pressured uh, the most. And so I thought that was really encouraging the way he keeps his eyes downfield. Uh, that was, that was fun to see for a guy, you know, making, you know, his second start. Uh, and then, I mean, look, it's impossible to talk uh, about the Trojans, the past game without mentioning Kyron Hudson, who had the catch of the year in week one. I mean, just incredible body control, hands, concentration, focus, the whole deal. That was so much fun to watch on that play and kind of set the tone, you know, for explosive plays in this game uh, for USC. I thought they doubled up LSU in terms of explosive plays on offense. And that was huge for a Lincoln Riley offense, huge on the flip side for the USC defense, which we'll get to here in a second. Secondly, I would expect Woody Marks as we push it forward uh, to week two against Utah State. By the way, I'm going to be there on the call with my buddies Guy Haberman and Yogi Roth, who were outstanding on the call of the Oregon game from the booth. Love those guys and love the fact that we're going to get to see this thing at 8 o'clock Pacific time from the Coliseum, USC, Utah State. See how Lincoln Riley's team responds. So excited for that. Woody Marks, I think it'll be a big story. Watch him on those counter plays, staple of the USC run game and kind of of Lincoln Riley's offense going back uh, in time. Uh, that was great. On the defensive front, can you know Anthony Lucas be that guy that really showed up in a big way for the defense? Like kind of came out of nowhere, had some pressures, was good on that defensive front. Uh, helping up, helping guys like you know Mason Cobb and Kamari Ramsey run the show from the second and third level. So it was really excited to watch the way that the defense played for USC in the first game under Danton Lynn as their defensive coordinator. So I'm really fired up to get a chance to see how they kind of stack another game and and do that against Utah State, who got a win in Week One. So that'll be a lot of fun from the Coliseum uh, on Saturday night. That's going to do it for us on Bally's. Of course, we will uh, continue on here on Sirius XM with a few more game previews. So appreciate you guys being with us. Uh, and we'll get back to, uh, I'm going to redo that part. That was weird. Okay. I'm going to just end Bally's uh, with like a wild line and then we'll just kind of say goodbye to Bally's and then I won't mention Sirius XM. Okay. All right, that's going to do it. Here we go. Three, two, one. All right, that's going to do it for us here with our friends on Bally's this week. Thanks for tuning in to Believe in Big Ten. We're back with you next week uh, for a look back at what happened in week two and paint the picture uh, as the conference moves into week three as well. I'm Rhett Lewis. We'll catch you next time. All right, continuing with a couple more previews here as uh, we're with you on Believe in Big Ten on Sirius XM. Maryland, Michigan State, the first conference game of the schedule. Boy, high expectations from East Lansing with the beginning of the Jonathan Smith era, the beginning of the Aiden Childs era at quarterback, and let's just say failure to launch. Win? Absolutely. Love to teach off a win. Way more than a loss, right? But that is the case for Michigan State right now. Was not pretty in any way for their very much hyped quarterback and very talented quarterback, Aiden Childs. So how, how do they go back into the film room, assess what didn't work out as well as they wanted in week one, and then make those corrections on the field and push things forward blocking out what happened in week one and now focus in on a very good conference opponent on the road in College Park, Maryland. I think it's going to be a big test for Michigan State. Big test on the maturity early on for a young quarterback and on Jonathan Smith's messaging early on in his tenure as this program's head coach. So a lot to be gained from this game on the Michigan State front and learning who they're going to be moving forward this season. For Maryland, resounding victory in week one as you kind of expected 
Billy Edwards, the quarterback here, beating out MJ Morris, who transferred in uh, to compete for that job. And I was really impressed, kind of the same way I've been impressed with Billy Edwards whenever he came in in relief duty for Talia Tungavailoa the last couple of years for this Terp offense. So um, can he stack games against a much more difficult opponent? Michigan State's defense, I thought, you know, by contrast, played pretty dang well last week. So that's where I think this game will ultimately be decided. How does Michigan State's defense and can Billy stand up to this Maryland offense, which is always explosive under Mike Loxley? And can Billy Edwards continue uh, his positive rhythm moving forward with a very talented group, Roman Hemby, that whole group there on offense? A lot of fun to watch uh, for the Terps. So excited to see what they have in store there. Um, and then, you know, Oregon, I think, is the last piece of the puzzle here uh, as we kind of look at some of these biggest previews. They're in for a battle against Boise State, especially after, you know, looking at the way they played against Idaho, less than inspiring in a number of ways. However, their defense, Oregon's defense is legit. Okay. They let up two gadget plays, trick plays, but otherwise really stomped out the life of the Idaho offense uh, in that opener. And I know the score doesn't necessarily tell that story, uh, but this, this Oregon defense is really, really good. Um, and Mateo Uyunglele, uh, Jordan Birch, Tatum Tuioti, uh, the guys up front in the middle, uh, Jeffrey Bassa, if he's able to come back and then Jabbar Muhammad on the back end is a absolute lockdown corner. Um, so excited to see those guys try to deal with Ashton Genty, uh, Genty and, and this Boise state offense, because they put up a ton of points against Georgia, Georgia Southern. Now, on the flip side, I think Oregon's offense has a real opportunity to kind of light things up this week. Uh, that Boise State defense did not leave a great first impression against Georgia Southern in an absolute shootout, right? And now you're going to fire up Austin Stadium once again, get that crowd rolling. And look, Dylan Gabriel played really well against Idaho. Yeah, he got sacked and pressured a little bit, had the turnover. But man, I mean, completed 40 passes, you know, well over, you know, almost 400 yards passing, a couple of touchdowns to Tez Johnson, who had 12 catches in this game. But they lacked the explosiveness. They lacked the explosive plays that you've come to expect from an Oregon offense, especially one as talented as this one. Watch out for the Oregon tight end room. Terrence Ferguson, you know, kind of showed why he's one of the best tight ends in the country in this game, had a, had a bunch of big catches. Kenyon Sadiq is a name to know. They will get him the ball in a variety of different ways on offense. I'm curious to watch the way that he attacks this Boise State uh, defense. And then look, at the run game, explosive backs. Jordan James, Noel Whittington, that duo is going to be one of the best in the country this year. And I think they'll find uh, some running lanes against Boise State. If, and this is kind of how it all comes together, the Oregon offensive line takes a big step forward this week against Boise. They got to protect Dylan Gabriel and open up the continue to open up those lanes in the run game. And if they do that, this Oregon team is right back to where they want to be, where those expectations had, had been set for them going into this season. All right, that's going to do it for us on this edition of Believe in Big Ten. Appreciate you guys being with us here on Sirius XM Big Ten Radio, channel 372, and available for you on the Sirius XM app. Uh, of course, give us a like, give us a, a subscription, hit us with comments on our YouTube page. Want to know what you guys think uh, about that matchup between Michigan and Texas. Want to know what you guys think about the Big Ten through week one as we head into week two. I'll get into the comments and answer whatever you got for us. I'm Rhett Lewis again. Thanks for being with us, and we'll catch you next time right here on Believe in Big Ten.